evening, everyone. Welcome to our MPC Online Bible Study. I'm Matthew McGlade, the lead and teaching pastor here at Mansfield Pentecostal Church. And every Tuesday night, we have a thought to think about, a question to ponder, and a text to study. And uh, we're continuing our Bible study series uh, titled Journeying Through the Hebrew Bible. And uh, we've been looking at the this big story of the Hebrew Bible. And what we've been doing is that we've been looking at the individual books uh, of the scriptures, of the, of the Old Testament, and how they... Uh, apply to us as Christians. We've looked at Genesis and you remember that last week we started to look at the second book of the Torah or the Pentateuch which is the book of Exodus and we saw that the book of Exodus is really the story about God's redemption, how God redeemed the Hebrews out of slavery to bring them into the land of promise that he uh, wanted for them and then how he wanted them to live in response to his work of redemption in their lives. Now last week we did look at the, the first steps of that process of redemption and what we're going to do tonight is that we're going to continue to look at the story of God's redeem, redeeming power, how he redeemed the Hebrews out of Egypt and then we're going to look specifically how that applies to us as Christians uh, before we venture into the rest of Exodus and particularly the book of Leviticus where it looks at the, how God wants us to live a holy life in response to God's work of redemption in our life. Now you remember that as we were starting to look at the story of God's redemption, that there was an object and there was a means of redemption. The object was the, the Hebrew people in the land of Egypt, the descendants of Jacob. Jacob came in as a family of 70 people, and over the period of 400 years, they grew to a population of nearly 2.5 million people. And they were coming under the slavery and the oppression of the Pharaoh at that time. And that Moses was God's servant and means to redeem his people out of Egypt. And we saw that after he murdered an Egyptian taskmaster, master, he fled to the Midian wilderness. And God called him. He broke his pride and called him to go back to Egypt to bring his people out of slavery. And over the, the next, next period of time, we saw that God displayed his power over the, Egyptians over the Egyptian deities and God, gods to redeem his people out of slavery. Now, we looked last week out of nine of ten of those plagues that God sent upon Egypt. But this culminated to the, most, um, the biggest or the most significant plague that God was going to bring about, and, and that was... The, the, that was the price that had to be paid to redeem the Hebrews out of Egypt. And that was the, that was the, the, the plague of the firstborn. And so we've seen the, the object, the means, and the power of God's redemption. Now we start to see the price of redemption. And so God says that a price has to be paid to redeem his people out of Egypt. And that was the price of the firstborn. Of every uh, um, human, uh, every uh, family, the firstborn of every family would die, whether it would be human life or animal life. And the pr that was the price that was to be paid to redeem his people out of Egypt. Now, very often we think that this was a price that was paid by the Egyptians. But the reality actually is this. It was a price that was paid by God. And the reason for that is because throughout the scripture, there's this underlying principle that the firstborn always belongs to God. The firstborn in every family, whether human or animal, always belongs to God. And so God was having to pay the price uh, for, for his people to be redeemed out of Egypt. And the Lord said that my angel will pass over the, the land of Egypt and God said that, that he will pass over every home and he will take the life of every firstborn in that home which, which actually belongs to God. Now we see that God gave some instructions to the Israelites if their firstborn was not, and even to the Egyptians as well, if their firstborn was not to die. And that was that the, la uh, uh, the blood of the lamb had to be applied on the doorpost of each home. And if the angel of death saw the blood, the angel would pass over that, that home, sparing the, the life of the firstborn of that home. And as we may be all, all familiar with the story, 
uh, the Israelites and all those who feared God, Egyptians as well, who respected God, when the Lord brings that warning to Pharaoh to say that if you do not uh, let my people go, this is what's going to happen. Many Egyptians and Hebrews applied the blood of the lamb over the doorposts and therefore the angel of death spared the life, the, fir- the life of the firstborn of each of those homes. Those to which the blood was not applied were not spared and the life was taken from those, the, those families. And so as you can imagine on that night throughout the land of Egypt there was a great uh, mourning and a great weeping and this was the price that had to be paid to, for God to redeem his people out of Egypt. And so we see both the object, the means, the power, and the price of redemption. But as the story of redemption goes on, we also see the sign of God's redemption. We now come to what is probably the most famous part of the story of Exodus. And that is sometimes referred to as the crossing of the Red Sea. And now there's been some debate among scholars as to where the Red Sea crossing actually occurred. And the answer to that question largely depends on where Mount Sinai is or where Mount Horeb is, where God brought his law to the Israelites. If Mount Sinai is, as is commonly believed, to be on the Sinai Peninsula, then the Red Sea crossing would have occurred uh, at a place called the, the Sea of Reeds or Yam Suf. And it's entirely possible that that is what happened. However, the Bible tells us that there were about two and a half million slaves who came out of Egypt, which would mean they took about a 50 50 day journey to get to Mount Horeb. And as well as that, from our mouths, we would know that actually that would make a column of people of nearly 110 miles long. So that's a huge amount of people traveling over a long distance, over a long period of time. And there's some indication to suggest that Mount Sinai wasn't actually at the Sinai Peninsula, but actually in the land of Midian, which is in what we call modern day Saudi Arabia, in which case uh, it would have been across the Gulf of Aqaba. So there's a strong suggestion that the Red Sea crossing occurred uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the Straits of, of Aqaba uh, to, to the east side of the Sinai Peninsula. And we see that there was an incredible miracle that happened. Uh, when God brought, led the, the, the Israelites through the Red Sea, or an east wind blew all night, creating a parting of water for the Israelites to pass over, uh, pass over onto the other side. And at the back of that, uh, the Egyptians who were following, trying to capture the Hebrew slaves, were swept away in, in the waters. After that event, we have the first song recorded in, the, in our Bible in Exodus chapter 15, where Miriam sang a song of praise of victory to God, saying that the horse and the rider God has thrown into the sea. As the story progresses, we see that the Israelites journeyed for a number of days in the wilderness to make their way to Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, where God was going to enter into a marriage covenant relationship with his people. And during that time, the Lord provided a white substance, that, uh, a nutritious substance, to, to sustain them and give them food to eat. And the slaves asked, or, or they, the, well, they were no longer slaves, and the Israelites asked, what is this? In the Hebrew, it's literally translated manna, what is it? And God provided this food, this bread from heaven, to sustain them during this time. Now, as we look at the story of redemption, of God delivering his people out of Egypt. We saw the object, the means, the power of God's redemption, the price that was paid to redeem his people and the and the sign of God's redemption in uh, bringing them through the Red Sea. We see a very strong parallel how that applies to the Christian life. Last week we saw that Christ is our means of redemption. We also saw that um, that he delivered us from the powers of the kingdom of darkness. As well as that, he, a price was paid for our redemption. Remember that they cost God, the firstborn of Egypt, to redeem his people. It was also costly for the Israelites to, to kill a lamb uh, to, to, to spare their firstborns from dying, uh, in the, in the, in, from dying in their homes. And in the same way, the Bible describes it's Jesus as God's firstborn. That Jesus is also a Passover lamb that he died in our place, 
that when Jesus died on the cross on that day, uh, at the moment that those Passover lambs were being slaughtered, he was the fulfillment uh, of, that, of that event. And so the price that was paid for our redemption was accomplished for us by Christ. As well as that, when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, the breaking of the bread, it's also a picture of the Jewish Passover feast. In fact, Paul builds on this when, Paul, when, when he says uh, that get rid of the old yeast so that you may be new and leavened batch as you already are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival not with the old unleavened bread with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of, of, of sincerity and truth. And so our breaking of bread is, in a sense, our Passover feast, as we remind ourselves of what, as, that, as God delivered the Hebrews out of Egypt, so God has delivered us out of the kingdom of darkness. And just as the Hebrews were to eat unleavened bread, so we are to live our lives without uh, deceit, without sin in the life, to lead a life that is holy unto, the, unto God. And as well as that, not only was there a price uh, of our redemption, but also there is a sign of our redemption. The Israelites went through the Red Sea. And in a similar way, there's a sign of our redemption is that we go through the waters of baptism. In fact, Paul builds on this when he writes to the Corinthians that they, speaking of the Israelites, were all baptized in Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And so there's a sense there, isn't there, for the Christian life. We are baptized, not in Moses, but we are baptized into the name of Jesus. Uh, and we open our hearts to receive also of his Holy Spirit. Spirit. One other thought as well, you remember that the Israelites were sustained with manna in the wilderness. In the same way, in our spiritual walk, we are sustained by our relationship with Jesus Christ, who described himself like the manna in the wilderness. In fact, Jesus said this, that very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. And Jesus is saying, I am the true bread of, he of heaven. So the manna that the Israelites experience in the wilderness is likened unto Christ in our life. And so we see these amazing parallels. As God redeemed the Israelites out of Egypt, so Christ has redeemed us. As the Israelites um, slaughtered the Passover lamb so that the firstborn would not die, so Christ is our firstborn, and he is also or the firstborn of God, I should say, and he is the Passover lamb who died in our place to redeem us from our sins. Uh, as the Israelites passed through the Red Sea uh, and were baptized into Moses, so we gone through the waters of baptism and are baptized in Christ. So there's strong parallels to the Christian life in the, in the, in the Exodus story of redemption. Now, but as the story unfolds, the Lord brings his people to a place called Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai in the Midian wilderness. And we start to see more of God's intentions for his people. God wanted to, wants to enter into a marriage ceremony with his people where he wants to be their God. He wants to be the center of their community life. He wants to be their king. He wants to be their minister of health and finance, of defense. He wants to be their all in all. And so we see that God brings them to Mount Sinai. When they camp around Mount Sinai, God's presence is revealed on the mountain and God brings his law to his people. But the truth is that God is on the mountain, but not in the camp of the people. But God, that's not where God wants to be. God wants to dwell amongst his people. He wants to be with his people at the center of the, his community. But before that can happen, he has to show his people how they are to live. He, God is a holy God. And he wants his people to be holy as he is holy so that he can dwell at the center of their lives. And this was the incredible privilege that was bestowed upon these former slaves. God redeemed his people out of Egypt to make them a kingdom of priests and a holy nation to enter the promise that God had for them with God being at the very center of who they were. 
They were not to be a, theocr a, a democracy, but they were to be a theocracy where God was there all in all. And what we're going to be doing next week, we're going to be looking at the next part of the Hebrew Bible. We're going to be looking at the next part of the book of Exodus and how that flows specifically into the book of Leviticus, which is the central book of the, of the law, of the Torah. And we're going to be looking to uh, drawing some very important lessons of how holiness impacts upon, wasn't just meant for the Israelites of the Old Testament, but actually it's also meant for us today as God's people. Well, guys, that's our thought to think about. A question to ponder is this. What does it mean for you to live as someone who's been redeemed by God? So what does it mean for you to live as someone who's been, who has been redeemed by God? And a text to study is I'd like you to read Exodus chapters 12, verses 12 to 13. And as you read the, those, few, uh, those two verses, what is the significance of the blood and the doorposts in this passage? How did it function as a sign for the Israelites? What does this event reveal about God's character and his expectations for his people? In what ways does the blood of the Passover lamb parallel the sacrifice of Jesus? And how should this understanding shape your life, especially in terms of how you respond to God's saving grace? Guys, I hope you got something out of that tonight. Hey, listen, have a great rest of the week and looking forward to seeing you over the weekend.